The title of this talk is Movement Disorders. These are the class objectives. You do not need to read them. We will use them to chart our talk. The talk will be conducted using conversational and question and answer formats. The first question is, Patrinsky is a sign of ectopyramidal disease. A true, B false. Central motor deficit can be divided in two groups. Those that occur as a consequence of corticospinal pathology and those that occur as a consequence of ectopyramidal pathology. In the next few frames, we will populate a table highlighting the difference between them. We will start by considering the character of alteration of muscle tone. In patients with corticospinal tract pathology, we find a spasticity manifested by the clasp knife effect. For those of you that may have never seen one, this is a clasp knife. They are hard to push down, but once you apply enough pressure, the blade quickly goes down. This type of resistance to passive movement of a patient's limbs is what we refer to as spasticity. In patients with extrapyramidal pathology, muscle tone findings are different. In the first form, the patient either present with equal resistance while passive movements are being tested. This type of resistance is referred to as plastic resistance or rigidity, or more colloquially referred to as lead pipe resistance. This later term is used because apparently pressure needed to bend a lead pipe needed to be continuous in order to bend it. The second type of ectopyramidal muscle tone alteration is intermittent and it is called cockwheeler rigidity. For those of you never seen a cockwheel, this is how a cockwheel looks. During testing, as you attempt to move the arm, you will feel loss of resistance followed by a quick giving in, followed by loss of resistance again and so on. The next clinical feature that helps distinguish these conditions is the distribution of hypertonicity. In patients with corticospinal pathology, hypertonicity prevails in the flexor muscles of the arm and extensors of the leg. This is a patient with corticospinal pathology. Notice the position of the arms, they are flexed, and the position of the legs, they are extended. In patients with ectopyramidal pathology, hypertonicity is generalized but flexion predominates. This is a representation of a patient with Parkinson's disease, the most prevalent ectopyramidal disorder. As you can see, the arms are flexed, the legs are bent, the trunk is also flexed. Next, we will address involuntary movements. Involuntary movements are absent in patients with corticospinal pathology. In patients with tapiramidal pathology, tremor, chorea, acetosis, and dystonia are frequently present. I will address each of these findings in the next few frames. Tremor is defined as an involuntary rhythmical alternating movement. It is convenient to classify tremor according to the state during which the tremor occurs. Using this parameter, we can classify tremor as resting, postural, action, and intentional. We will first talk about resting tremor. Resting tremor is often referred to as pill rolling tremor because the tremor resembles a person rolling pills between the index and the thumb. Resting tremors most of the time consist of flexion extension movements at the wrist and fingers. Resting tremor occurs mainly at rest. Frequency of oscillations is low, about 4 per second, 
the degree of excursion or displacement of the body part involving the tremor is moderate, the location most often involved are the limbs. Resting tremor is most often encountered in patients with Parkinson's disease. Postural tremor. Postural tremor is present while maintaining a position. It is a high frequency tremor, usually 8 Hz or above. The degree of excursion of movement is small. It most often involves the limbs and is found in essential tremor, a familiar condition, and in hyperthyroidism, among other conditions. After postural tremor, we will talk about action tremor. Action tremor is worsened by or only present during movement. It is high frequency, excursion of the body part involved is small, location most often involved are the limbs. This tremor usually occurs in conjunction with postural tremor in essential tremor, the condition we previously mentioned. Both components of essential tremor, postural and action tremors, are worsened by anxiety and better by drinking, not recommended, and beta blockers. Action tremor may also occur in association with hyperthyroidism. By drinking, I mean drinking alcohol. In this figure, the number of lines by the index and little finger indicate the degree of tremor. In this frame, the hand is far from the target. Tremor is moderate. In this frame, when the arm is closer to the target, the degree of tremor remains the same. This finding is characteristic of action tremor. After action tremor, we're going to talk about intentional tremor. Intentional tremor is often called terminal tremor because it worsens at the end of the movement as the target is being reached. In this figure, the number of lines by the index and little finger again indicates the degree of tremor. When the heart is far from the target, the tremor is moderate. Here, the hand is closer to the target and the number of lines has increased, representing an increase in the degree of intensity of the tremor. Thus, intentional tremor worsened by or is only present as the target is reached. The frequency of oscillation of intentional tremor is initially low, but increases as the hand gets closer to the target. The excursion of the oscillation is moderate, especially as the target is reached. Intentional tremor involves mainly the limbs, and this zigzag like motion is most often seen in alcoholics and other conditions. The classic cerebellar tremor is often intentional tremor. Chorea is defined as an involuntary spasmodic movement, especially of the limbs and facial musculature. This engraving from 1880 depicts these movements. As you can see, they involve the left hand, the right hand, the neck, wrist, leg, foot, and the face. This activity tends to migrate from one area of the body to another in quick succession. Korea was frequently encountered in Sydenham's Korea when rheumatic fever was frequent, and currently, when we see it, not often, we see it in patients with Huntington Korea. In this frame, I have placed the figure of the boy in the middle of the frame to mimic the pattern of movement seen in Korea. Notice as the frames move, 
the change in posture in your screen. So you can appreciate why Korea was called a dance. Now I have added a painting of San Vito. San Vito is the Catholic patron saint of artists and dancers. It was because of these two points, one, that the dystonia looks like a dance, and two, because the patron saint of dancer is called Saint Vito, that Korea was named Saint Vito's dance. In Germany, in the 13th century, an epidemic of Saint Vito's dance occurred. This event inspired Peter Bruegel, the younger, to paint this theme. Athetosis is defined as slow, snake-like, writhing movement, especially of the fingers. As you can see, depicted in this frame. In this condition, the hand takes many different and unusual positions. As the one here with fingers extended, here with the thumb contracted, and here with extension of some fingers and flexion of others. Dystonia is defined as an involuntary contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles leading to a position of extreme flexion or extension. Dystonia can be generalized or focal. Generalized dystonia can be an impressive condition involving the hands, shoulders, neck, and also the lower extremities. Focal dystonia can selectively involve the limbs or the face. Limb involvement is rather common. The most frequent type of focal limb dystonia affects the hand. Dystonia of the hand is often the first sign of ectopyramidal disease. In the face, dystonia is less frequent. This patient had a rare condition called Schwartz-Champel syndrome. These patients suffer from muscle rigidity, but in addition, they have episode of eyelid dystonia. Eyelid dystonia is called blepharospasms. Next, we will address tendon reflexes. They are increased in corticospinal pathology and normal or slightly increased in patients with ectopyramidal pathology. Badinsky sign is present in patients with corticospinal pathology, absent in patients with ectopyramidal pathology. Inability to voluntarily generate movements occurs in patients with corticospinal pathology, but is absent or only minimal in patients with ectopyramidal pathology. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Parkinsonism and Parkinson disease are the same. A true, B false. Parkinsonism usually refers to a combination of akinesia or bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremors. In the presence of such findings, we must consider three types of conditions. Parkinson disease, secondary Parkinsonism, and Parkinson disease mimickers. The reason we must consider these conditions is that they have different treatments. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Knowledge of anatomy and neurophysiology is needed to understand Parkinson disease. A true, B false. To understand Parkinson's disease, we must have reasonable knowledge of three neurological elements concerning structures, connections, and pathways of the ectopyramidal system. We will first consider ectopyramidal related structures. In this frame, I have placed a view of the left hemisphere. The white line here indicates the line of dissection corresponding to this view. This view. Seven movement important structures. A structure number one. I have now added a figure representing the thalamus. You can recognize it as being the thalamus by the geniculi. The arrow just introduced in the 
cut a specimen points to the thalamus, which I have just traced. And I have represented it here. The VA and VL inside the rectangle stand for ventral anterior and ventrolateral nuclei. I intend to populate this figure by adding all the structures as I introduce them. I will later use this figure to explain the connections and pathways that are important to understand Parkinson's disease. I will refer to this figure as the basic figure throughout the course of this talk. This figure will get very busy, as you will see soon. The second structure I will introduce as a yellow structure is the globus pallidus, the final output nucleus of the basal ganglia. The arrow I have just added indicates to the left and now to the right globus pallidus. Notice that the globus pallidus has two parts, the parts external and the parts internal. Hence, I will add the globus pallidus in the basic figure as two yellow structures, one representing the external, which I have labeled GPE, and the second one, the internal segment of the globus pallidus, which I have labeled GPI. The third structure I will first represent in the uncut specimen by the green oval structure I just added. It is the subthalamic nucleus, which you can see indicated by the arrow in the cut specimen, and I have just delineated. The thalamus is above it, hence the name subthalamic nucleus. Here I am pointing to the right subthalamic nucleus, which I have just traced. So, to the basic figure, I will add the subthalamic nucleus as a green rectangle. The fourth structure I will mention to you, which I am now schematizing in the uncut specimen, is the substantia nigra, which I am now indicating in the cut specimen on the left, and now on the right. This is a specimen of a, a midbrain. The substantia nigra is normal. Here I am pointing to the pars compacta, which I have delineated in the opposite side. Here I am pointing to the pars reticulata, which I have delineated in the opposite side. So we will introduce a new element to the basic figure, the pars compacta of the substantia nigra. The fifth structure is is the largest of all vasoganglionic structure. It is called the striatum, which I am indicating with the arrow. As you can see, it has a very odd shape. The area of the striatum indicated by the arrow in the uncut specimen corresponds to the area indicated by the arrow in the cut specimen at this point. This area is called the putamen. This area that I am now indicating in the cut specimen is the body of the caudate nucleus. It corresponds to the area I am now indicating in the uncut specimen. And the area indicated now in the uncut specimen corresponds to the area occupied by the pyramidal tract. The little dark structure I am pointing to in the cut specimen with a triangular shape corresponds to the tail of the caudate nucleus. So to the basic figure we will add the striatum with an odd shape reflecting the shape of the real structure. The sixth structure is the pedunculopontine nuclei or pedunculopontine tegmentum nucleus, which I have indicated here in the uncut specimen and here in the cut specimen. So to the basic figure we will add as a light green rectangle 
de pedúnculo pontine nucleus. The seventh structure is the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex involved with movement, mainly in the frontal cortex, is the one represented here. So we have introduced the structures. Now we will talk about connections. There are many connections among the structures we have just named. I will tell you about 11 connections that are important to our narrative. The order I will introduce them to you is the one I found more helpful to understand how they are affected in Parkinson's disease and other conditions associated with extrapidamidal deficit. The first one I will mention goes from the thalamus to the cortex. This is an excitatory connection. Glutamate, the correct amount of it, keeps movement smooth. The second connection goes from the internal segment of the globus pallidus to the ventrolateral nucleus and ventral anterior nucleus of the thalamus. This is an inhibitory connection. The third connection also goes from the internal segment of the globus pallidus but to the pedunculopontine tegmentum nucleus. The balance function of this nucleus is also important for movement to be smooth. The fourth connection goes from the external segment of the globus pallidus to its internal segment. This is an inhibitory connection that uses GABA. The fifth connection goes from the subthalamus nucleus to the internal segment of the globus pallidus. This is an excitatory connection. The sixth connection goes from the striatum to the internal segment of the globus pallidus. This is an inhibitory connection. The seventh connection goes from the external segment of the globus pallidus to the subthalamic nucleus. This is an inhibitory connection. The eighth connection goes from the striatum to the external segment of the globus pallidus. This is an inhibitory connection. The ninth connection goes from the cerebral cortex to the striatum. This is an excitatory connection. The tenth connection goes from the substantia nigra pars compacta to the striatum. This is an inhibitory connection mediated by dopamine 2. The eleventh connection goes also from the pars compacta of the substantia nigra to the striatum. This is an excitatory connection mediated by dopamine 1. It is important to notice this little asterisk I have just added, because a prior hypothesis to explain Parkinson's disease considered the internal segment of the globus pallidus and pars reticulata of the substantia nigra as one functional entity. And if you do not know this, you may get confused when you read older versions. We have finished talking about connections, and now we will talk about pathways. There are two pathways, the direct and indirect pathways. It is the balance between these pathways that produces smooth movements. Let's first talk about the direct pathway. This is the basic figure we built. In it, I will indicate and trace the direct pathway. The direct pathway facilitates movements. The direct pathway goes from the substantia nigra pars compacta to the striatum and from the striatum to the internal segment of the globus pallidus and from there to the thalamus and from the thalamus to the cortex. Here I have traced it with a white line as you can see in this figure and in this new frame. Now we will describe the indirect pathway. The indirect pathway inhibit movements. It goes from the pars compacta through the external segment of the globus pallidus to the subthalamic nucleus. From the subthalamic nucleus to the internal segment of the globus pallidus and from the internal segment of the globus pallidus goes 
via thalamus to the cortex? So the answer to this question is A. Next question. In Parkinson's disease, the amount of glutamate going from the ventral anterior and ventrolateral thalamic nuclei to the cortex is increased. A true, B false. Now that we know all that is needed to know to understand Parkinson's disease and all is clear, we are going to start talking about Parkinson's disease. As you know, Parkinson's disease is a hypokinetic condition. In the next few frames, I will show the changes leading to Parkinson's disease. I will use a thinning of the lines in this figure to indicate decreased function in the nucleus from which they, they originate, and a thicker line to indicate increased function in the nucleus from which they originate. As you can see in this frame, the failure of Substantia nigra pars compacta is represented by thinner connections. This leads to decreased inhibition of the internal segment of the globus pallidus, but at the same time, since the other part compacta connection is inhibitory, the lack of inhibition of the inhibitory segment of the striatum will produce increased inhibition of the external segment of the globus pallidus. The increased inhibition of the external segment of the globus pallidus will decrease the inhibition of the internal segment of the globus pallidus and decrease the inhibition of the subthalamic nucleus. The decreased inhibition of the subthalamic nucleus will increase excitation of the internal segment of the globus pallidus. So the internal segment of the globus pallidus is less inhibited and more excited, leading to hyperfunction of the internal segment of the globus pallidus. This increase in function is depicted here by increasing the thickness of the lines going to the thalamus and the pedunculopontine nucleus, as you can see. The increased function of the internal part of the globus pallidus will lead to decrease excitation of the cortex by the thalamus, as indicated here. In the first eight, the neurotransmitter pattern found in Parkinson's disease includes, in addition to low dopamine, low serotonin from the RAF nuclei, and high acetylcholine from the basal nucleus of major. So the answer to this question is false, B. Next question. In Parkinson's disease, environmental and genetic factors interact to produce targeted neuronal death. A true, B false. Neuronal death in Parkinson's disease occurred in selective nuclei, most notably in the pars compacta of the substantia nigra. The neuronal death appears to occur due to oxidative stress at the level of the mitochondria, dysfunction of the ubiquitin proteosome system at the level of the cytoplasm, and local inflammation. The cause appears to be genetic, although this can only be proven in about 5% of the cases, and environmental. The data about environmental factor is conflicting. Exposure to pesticides may increase chances to develop Parkinson. Some authorities believe that drinking alcohol and coffee and smoking decreases the chances of developing Parkinson's disease. He knew. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The pathological hallmark of Parkinson's disease are Lewy bodies and reduction of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. A true, B false. The disease Parkinson described in 1817 is pathologically characterized by the presence of Lewy bodies in the substantia nigra, here shown in two melanized dopamine neurons. There is also reduced number of cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta, as you can see in this picture, especially when you compare it with the normal control. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Most likely written by a patient with Parkinson's disease, A or B? The motor manifestation of Parkinson's disease can be easily memorized by remembering that 
that Parkinson's disease traps your body. The T stands for tremor, the R for rigidity, the A for akinesia or bradykinesia, the P stands for postural instability, the first S for shuffling gait, the second S for small handwriting. The answer to this question is A. Next question, who is more likely to develop Parkinsonism? A, a dancer, B, a boxer, C, a chess player, D, a swimmer. When Parkinsonism is due to known conditions, we refer to it as secondary Parkinsonism. Secondary Parkinsonism can be due to drugs. It may occur in patients taking antipsychotics or antiemetics that block dopamine receptors. In patients taking dopamine antagonists, secondary Parkinsonism must be differentiated from tardive dyskinesia. The distinction is usually easily made. Patients with Parkinsonism have difficulty moving, where patients with tardive dyskinesia have difficulty not moving. The adventitial movement in Parkinson's disease are mainly tremors. The adventitial movement in tardive dyskinesia consists of smooth limb and trunk movements, usually occurring in conjunction with tongue protrusion and rolling, lip sucking and smacking, jaw chewing, facial muscle twitching. The diagnosis of tardive dyskinesia can only be made if movements last for over one month after medication is stopped. Secondary Parkinsonism can occur in patients taking Valproic. I will tell you about two children I saw that did. This is an article of two patients we saw that while on Valproic acid for seizures develop tremor suggestive of Parkinsonism and dementia. The interesting thing about them was the MRI. This is the MRI of one of them while on medication. Notice the size of the ventricles and sulci. And this is 12 months after Vaproic was stopped. Notice the ventricles and sulci are now normal. Hence, it is important in patients with drug-induced Parkinsonism to stop medication soon before changes become irreversible. Secondary Parkinsonism can also occur in boxers. This is Muhammad Ali when young, here when old. See the facial expression. The term mask face has been used to describe it. Small vessel disease can also produce secondary Parkinsonism. This is an MRI of a patient with secondary Parkinsonism, showing large number of little infarcts in the vasoganglionic area. Patients with this condition, in addition to Parkinsonism, usually display other signs of CNS abnormalities. And last but not least, infections. Some patients afflicted by prion disease and HIV or after viral encephalitis may develop Parkinsonism. So the answer to this question is B, boxer. Next question, which of the following conditions may mimic Parkinson? A, multiple system atrophy. B, progressive supranuclear palsy. C, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration. D, all of the above. The third group of diseases we must consider in patients presented with Parkinsonism are Parkinson's disease mimickers. We are going to talk about four conditions, multiple system atrophy, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration, and Wilson's disease. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, which of the following structures is less likely to be involved in multiple system atrophy, dash P? A, substantia nigra, B, estriatum, C, autonomic neurons, D, cerebellum. The first condition we will address is multiple system atrophy mimicking Parkinson. 
This is the sign as MSA-P. The P stands for Parkinsonism. It manifests by a combination of Parkinsonism and autonomic findings where Parkinsonism features predominate. When automatic findings predominate, it is called MSA-A. Patients with MSA-P, in addition to Parkinsonism, also have autonomic findings such as orthostatic hypotension due to loss of intermediolateral horn cells in the spinal cord and pigmented nucleus in the brain stem, erectile dysfunction, urinary retention, dry mouth, and loss of sweating. MRI findings in patients with SMAP are better appreciated when viewed in relation to control using an MRI sequence that allows visualization of the basal ganglia. This is the head of the caudate which is quite preserved in this case. This is the putamen, which is severely affected here. This is the globus pallidus, which is also affected, but to a lesser extent, in patients with, with MSAP. The pathophysiology of multiple system atrophy is readily understood if we consider the steps leading to MSA. Sporadic environmental and genetic factors trigger a set of pathologies leading to atrophy involving multiple neurological systems. One of these steps is the deposition of synuclein. The deposition of this substance produces inclusion bodies that can be found in the bodies of glia cells, in neuron cytoplasm, and in neuronal nucleus. So the answer to this question is T. Next question. Progressive supranuclear palsy is characterized by gait disturbance and inability to look up or down. A true, B false. Another condition that may mimic Parkinson's disease is progressive supranuclear palsy. The initial symptoms are usually on a steady gait and axial dystonia. Then comes supranuclear thermoplegia. Initially, vertical movements are affected. First, it is hard to look down. Later, it is hard to look up. Then it becomes impossible to look up or down. This is followed by involvement of voluntary lateral eye movements. This is the stage that defines the condition. Although initially, fixation mediated movements and dull eye movements while on a fixed target are preserved, they may also go and the eye becomes fixed in primary position. It is at this stage that the patients with PSP develop signs of cerebral palsy. This is a set of pictures drawn by Jean Martin Charcot of patients that appeared from the description he gave that met the current criteria for the diagnosis of PSP. The facial expression is often described as one of continuous amazement or surprise. They often develop vertical wrinkles in the glabellar region and breaches of the nose. This is called the procerus sign. I will now show you a set of facial photographs of patients with this condition so you can appreciate the extent of facial changes they incurred. Here you can see procerus sign or vertical wrinkling of the forehead, the surprise look, the anxious look brought about by chin dystonia, and the mask faces. MRI findings are characteristic but not pathognomonic. They reflect atrophy and a sparing of different midbrain structures, as will be apparent when talking about the pathological changes encountered in these patients. The MRI findings have been associated to different animals. You can see in this MRI the penguin sign as reflected here. In this one, the hummingbird sign as reflected here. And in this one, the Mickey Mouse 
sign as depicted here. The pathological changes found in these patients, as we previously mentioned, explain the MRI appearance. In this specimen, all the dark areas represent damage. The damage mainly involves the midbrain tegmentum with a sparing of the tectum and the peduncles. The aqueduct of Silvius is enlarged. Please view this video by either going to Clinical Movement Disorder course page, if available to you, or going to the article stated below. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. A patient presented with findings of an alien hand is likely to have A. Multisystem atrophy, B. Progressive supranuclear palsy, C. Corticobasal gang ganglionic degeneration, D. Spastic monopyresis. Among the conditions mimicking Parkinson's disease, corticobasal ganglionic degeneration, in my opinion, is the most tragic. The clinical manifestation of corticobasal ganglionic degeneration consists of progressive asymmetrical extrapidermal rigidity, usually manifest as an asymmetrical clumsy limp that when affecting the arm has been called an alien hand. A unilateral echinetic rigid syndrome is also often seen in this condition. To the sign of ectopidaminal disease, signs of cortical spinal disease often follows. Then vertical gaze limitation comes in, frontal lobe release signs appear, and dementia establishes itself. Go to this YouTube video and see how dramatic this condition can be. The pathology of corticobasal ganglionic degeneration consists of asymmetrical cerebral atrophy. Notice that the left hemisphere is smaller than the right. In this specimen, you can see atrophy of the head of the caudate. In this new section of the midbrain and pons, you can see the pigmentation of the substantia nigra and of the locus ceruleus. Histologically, in this condition, you can find balloon neurons using H and E, as the one you see in this frame, or when you use anti alpha beta crystalline antibody stains, the neurons also look like a balloon. In addition, we also find diffuse tau deposits in neurons. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Copper transporting ATPase 2 is important to transport copper from the intestine to the portal system. A true, B false. This is a representation of the portal system. I will use it to explain copper metabolism. Copper is normally ingested with different food sources. From the intestine cells, with the help of copper transporting ATP ACE1, a protein produced by a gene called ATPA, copper enters in the portal circulation and it is delivered to the liver. In the liver, with the help of copper transporting ATPase 2, a protein produced by a gene called ATP7B is either sent to the general circulation or excreted in the bile. I would explain this in more details in the next few frames. The gene that produces copper transporting ATPase 1 is located in the X chromosome at the Q21.1 locus. Copper transporting ATPase 1 is not only present in the enterocyte, but also in many other cells, but not in hepatocytes. This enzyme, in the presence of a low or normal copper level, transport copper to the Golgi apparatus, where copper is incorporated to other proteins or serve as a cofactor for certain enzymes, including dopamine beta hydroxylase. This enzyme 
copper transporting ATPase 1 in the presence of high copper levels behaves differently. Copper transporting ATPase 1 in the enterocyte when confronted with too much copper moves away from the Golgi and helps to dispose of excessive copper in the stools. So that is a story of ATP7A gene. Now let's tell the story of ATP7B gene. This gene is located in chromosome 13 at locus Q14.3. It is present in the liver. In the hepatocyte, it is used for the production of many enzymes and also to form seroplasmin, the most important copper transporting protein in the body. When the amount of copper in the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte is normal or low, copper transporting ATPase 2 is mostly in the Golgi apparatus and incorporates copper to a protein forming a compound called seroplasmin, as we previously mentioned, and little is excreted in the bile. When the amount of copper in the hepatocyte is high, as depicted in this new added figure, copper transporting ATPase 2 moves away from Golgi, going to the apical side of the cell and helps excrete copper in the form of bile. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Please take a look at this figure and make a diagnosis. A. Hemibalism. B. Huntington's chorea. C. Gilles de la Tourette. D. Menke's disease. The first choice in this question is hemibalism. Hemibalism is characterized by sudden wild flailing movements involving one side of the body. It is due to unilateral damage of the contralateral subthalamic nucleus. The second choice in this question, that is choice B, is Huntington's chorea. Huntington's chorea is an autosomal dominant condition due to expanded trinucleotide repeats CAG in the Huntington gene of chromosome 4. Genetic anticipation is common in this condition, with manifestation occurring earlier and more pronounced with each, each passing generation. The clinical manifestations of Huntington's chorea are chorea, atetosis, aggressivity, depression, and dementia. In the first eight, the neurotransmitters pattern assigned to Huntington's disease include decreased acetylcholine from the basal nucleus of Mayner, increased dopamine from the part compacta of substantia nigra, and decreased GABA from the nucleus accumbens. MRI findings are characteristic but not pathognomonic. They reflect atrophy of the affected areas. As you can see, this is a coronal MRI in a patient with Huntington's chorea. You can see bilateral atrophy of the caudate and diffuse cerebral cortical atrophy. The pathology of Huntington's chorea can be appreciated viewing a brain of a Huntington's chorea patient and a controlled normal brain side by side. The caudate and the putamen are atrophic. The role of death in these structures is believed to occur due to abnormal protein metabolism and glutamate excitotoxicity. Continuous glutamate and MDA receptor stimulation produces sustained opening of the NMDA channels leading to intracellular calcium overload and contributing to cell death. Cortical atrophy is also present, as well as ex facto ventriculomegaly. The third choice in this question is Gilles de la Tourette or Tourette syndrome. Tourette syndrome is characterized by two cardinal findings sudden non voluntary twitches or movement called motor tics and sudden utterance called vocal tics. They must be present for over one year to establish the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome. These findings start before 18 years of age. The cause is unknown, but it is believed 
to be a chemical imbalance in the basal ganglia that produces no consistent MRI detectable abnormality. Go to YouTube and watch this video. It only lasts about four minutes. The last choice in this question is Menke's disease. Menke's disease is an X-linked recessive condition due to functionally defective copper transporting ATPase 1, some called Menke's protein. This abnormal copper transporting ATPase 1 is produced by a mutated ATPA gene. Consequently, the lack of copper transport to the portal system and to the liver results in no copper being available to produce copper-dependent enzymes. The consequence of the lack of these enzymes will be presented in the next few frames. Sulfidrylic oxidase deficiency will produce abnormal hair. The hair breaks easily and is twisted. From there is that the name of kinky hair syndrome comes. Other enzymes are also affected. Those enzymes just added by different mechanisms will lead to brain damage. And lysine oxidase deficiency will produce abnormal collagen and as a consequence, many abnormalities. Tortuous filial arteries here shown in the brain, often leading to subdurals. Arterial aneurysm, here you can see a larger right internal iliac artery aneurysm and a smaller left common iliac artery aneurysm. Frial bones can lead to fractures. To remember some of the manifestation of Menke syndrome or disease, think kinky, which means twisty. And remember this figure. Kinky hair, kinky arteries, and kinky bones. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Kaiser Fletcher ring is only important when it is a ring. A true, B false. This drawing shows some of the organs involved in a patient with Wilson disease. Wilson disease is an autosomal recessive disorder that, as you can see, can affect many organs. We will first look at the eye findings. This is a representation of a normal cornea. A normal cornea has five layers. Epithelial, Bowman's layer, stroma, decement membrane, and endothelial layer. The deposition of copper occurs in the decement membrane. The speed of copper deposition is variable, but a full ring is a relatively late finding. Here you can see the evolution. No deposition of copper can be visualized in normal people as well as in some patients early in the course of Wilson disease. As time advances, minimal deposition is seen. Then deposition occurs in non-contiguous areas, as you can see here in the upper and the lower pole of the cornea. And finally, the ring is complete. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The panda face sign may be present in Wilson's disease. A true, B false. So we look at the eye. Now I will briefly mention the liver damage. Liver damage is very prominent in some patients but hardly present in others. When present, the liver becomes large and cirrhotic due to accumulation of copper in the hepatocyte and subsequent death. Brain pathology is common and often predominates. The involvement of the organs in this drawing may occur in an acute or in a chronic form. In the acute form, Wilson disease present with bradykinesia, behavioral changes, involuntary movements, liver disease. Wilson disease presented in a chronic form consists of marked proximal winging beating tremor, dysarthria, dystonia, and rigidity, hand dystonia being the most frequent type of dystonia we see, but later on in the course they develop focal dystonia involving the precious muscle. This type of dystonia has been called 
Rhesus sardonicus. In addition, patients with this presentation often have choreoatetoid movements, psychosis, behavioral disorders, and dementia. The liver is also affected, but less severely, in the chronic presentation. Brain MRI changes consist of symmetrical hyperintense changes best visualized in T2 weighted images, mainly affecting the putamen and the caudate nuclei, but also the thalami and midbrain and pons. This is an MRI of a patient with Wilson disease. You can see basoganglia involvement, but also thalamic involvement. But the cutest MRI finding in Wilson disease is the panda sign, as you can see here. This finding is due to swelling of the white matter in the midbrain with relative sparing of the peduncles and the red nucleus. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. In Wilson's disease, urine copper is high. In Minkis disease, urine copper is low. A true, B false. When Mr. Copper is jailed in the enterocyte, Minkis disease happens. When Mr. Copper is jailed in the hepatocytes, Wilson disease happens. Serum seroplasmin is low in both. In Menkes, because copper does not get to the liver. In Wilson's disease, because the liver does not know the right thing to do with it and fails to attach copper to the globulin, thus cannot produce seroplasmin. 24 hour urine copper is low in Menkes because it is not absorbed by the intestine, but high in Wilson's disease because copper unattached to seroplasmin leaks from the liver into the blood. Then the copper in the blood is filtered by the kidney thus concentrated in the urine. Serum copper in minkis is low because copper is not absorbed by the intestine. In Wilson's disease, with significant liver damage, serum copper is high, but serum copper is low if the liver is not affected or if it is only minimally affected. So the answer to this question is true. Thank you very much for your attention.